All right, since we just had Memorial Day, I started a couple of weeks ago working on this one. We're going to do it a little different. I'm going to talk you through some of it very quickly. And then I found a, a video that does a whole lot better at explaining what the, the point I wanted to try to get across than uh, I can. So we'll look at it at the very end. Any idea what song we're talking about here? Say that again. God Save the Queen was the original melody for this song that we're going to talk about today, but it was not, um, the words were totally different. Any idea? It's a patriotic song. All right. My country tis of thee. That it was the unofficial na national anthem until the Star Spangled Banner came along, but this one was uh, what they used at the very beginning. Samuel Francis Smith, born in 1808 and died in 1895. This was written in 1831. He was born in Boston, and he died on November the 16th, which is an awesome day. November the 16th is the day that um, royalty was born. And um, so, you know, uh, yes which is me. Uh, so I take gifts clean on up to the end of the month. You know, I don't want none of y'all to be strapped. So. Can I clarify something I just said? Sure. Uh -huh. I don't want to mislead y'all. In 1380, in the 80s, the first English Bible was handwritten. The first printed Bible was in 1450, and that was by Gutenberg. Because the Gutenberg Press so it was a hand printed, I mean a printed Bible on a press it was not till 1450 by Gutenberg. So that's a little distinction there. All right. All right. Mr. Samuel Smith had six children. He was a Baptist minister. He was a journalist, an author. Um, and the original title to this was simply titled America. He attended Harvard and Andover Theological Seminary. The very first time it was ever sung was uh, by a children's choir in 1831 on July the 4th. was the very first time that it was ever sung. Now, he wrote these words before he wrote the, the verses um, that led him to writing this song. And this is, these are his words. Government, society, and the church must just leave people free to act according to conscience. A godless society would come when each individual accepted Jesus. My country tis of thee is a Baptist anthem to a country of the free individual. You agree? Yeah, yeah. He went on to say this, It is my opinion that the government should not be in any shape, form, or fashion involved in my spiritual life. Now, if we say that, then we've got to also say that the government should not be involved in other individuals' spiritual life, depending on what religion <laughs> that they have chosen to do. But you and I should be free to worship and to serve and to live our life, to assemble according to the, the Holy Spirit and the, the guidance from our relationship with Christ without any government interference. So he wrote these words. The first verse says, My country tis of thee, Sweet land of liberty, of the I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. What do you think he meant when he wrote Tis of Thee? Most of us would think that he said, my country, it's of you. But Tis of Thee means it's because of you. He's actually saying here that the Tis of Thee is God. My country because of what you have done, God, is a sweet land of liberty. So it is not, it wasn't intended to reference or to for us to praise or exalt a country. It was for us to exalt a God who was the author of our, our country and the principles that we were founded on. 
The last part says, let freedom ring. What in the world could that mean? If you've never had the opportunity to hear Gaither Vocal Band do a song called Let Freedom Ring, please do so. It will make the hair on your arm stand up. It is phenomenal. The first verse talks about um, our nation, and then the second verse talks about what Christ did for us. And I love the phrase that David Phelps says that by the Calvary, Christ stamped pardoned on my heart and on yours. And that it, it's a wonderful message. But we're not on that song tonight. So, All right, let freedom ring. It's a statement that the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness should be spread across the earth and allowed to flourish. Let freedom ring is saying that we should have the freedom or God, please, by your providence, let it ring out. Let it continue to ring out all over the world, the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The freedom that we have to pursue life and liberty and for you and I to, uh, to live our life. Now, today's time, they don't really want you and I to, to live by our own pursuits of happiness or by the liberties we have in Christ. I read an article today that a very knowledgeable high official made the statement that poor people should be allowed to uh, steal from any store because they're hungry. And that we are, you should, because you're hungry and in need, you should be allowed to just steal anything you want and meet your need. You did what? So you identify as poor. Okay, that's the next step. And you're just going to go in and break. And, it, and the, wonderfully so, the news is eating her lunch because she, she spoke it and knew very well what she said. I don't know whether she truly believes it, but do you see our land as a sweet land of liberty? Say it again, brother. Absolutely. Yeah. And even in the condition that we're in, we're afforded a whole lot more liberties than most countries are. And they, they control uh, people's very life and existence and what they can and can't do. Um, the... Well, the Liberty Bell is there, but this is not what the reference is here. His intention is, is God may your word and your kingdom continue to ring freedom that's available to you and I and Christians as long as the world and the earth exist. May we keep having that freedom to be able to gather together as brothers and sisters, to be able to uh, worship and serve the God that, you know, the, the God and so that's his purpose, what is thought there. Um, but the Liberty Bell is certainly a symbol of, our, uh, of the ringing of the, the freedom. Liberty means a free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority. Do you feel like you have that? Are you free from oppression? I tend today to say no. I think that as Christians, we are more oppressed today than we have been, you know, in any of the other years. Certainly, and, and if you go back and look at the statistics, in the 40s and the 50s, um, the majority, 90s, 90 percent or more, believed in the Almighty God, believed in the God of Christian uh, values that you and I serve. Now we are seeing a drastic reduction in that. And the freedoms that you and I had to, um, to serve God has starting to be um, stepped on. And we're not able to do some of the things that we used to do. Uh, praying in school is for one. Public prayer in school is one. Prayer's never been kicked out of school because you and I have the freedom to pray anywhere we want to. And, but uh, certainly those things are there. And then you've got all of the uh, things like the Liberty Bell, but you have the Ten Commandments that's been taken off of government uh, properties. You've got all of this stuff that was, is being taken away from us. 
as a Christian nation instead of being embraced by us. The last verse says, Our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty. Who's the author of liberty? God. To thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Everything he is saying in that verse is pointing to the God that gave us the liberties that we have, which is a wonderful verse. He got this from Psalms 33. So I'm going to read to you if you want to follow along. Psalms 33, 8 through 22. Psalms is in the Old Testament. Go to Matthew and take a left. Psalm 33, starting with verse 8. And see if this does not sound like the principles that the United States of America was founded on. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord nullifies the plan of nations. He frustrates the plans of people. The plan of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen from his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all of the sons of mankind. From his dwelling place he looks out on all of the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. The king is not saved by mighty army. A warrior is not rescued by great strength. A horse is a false hope of victory. Nor does it rescue anyone from its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his faithfulness, to rescue their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your favor, Lord, be upon us just as we have waited for you. Does that not sound like a creed that we could add to the Constitution? That when they formed it all of those years ago, that they read this part to determine the direction that God wanted for our kingdom and that we are putting him in the place of rulership and king uh, over our individual nation. It is wonderful that we have armies and we have uh, powers and we have um, military and personnel that are there protecting our freedoms. I've heard many stories and I wish that I could find out how many of them were true, but I even heard uh, last week when Israel and um, the Palestinians were fighting in the doing the shooting the bombs and stuff over each one the missiles um, that a guy in the Palestinian army has been quoted as saying their God redirected our missiles and that he could physically see them aiming somewhere and all of a sudden they turn and go somewhere else I don't know if that's true but I would love to know that some of that you know that the God of the earth, our, our God, not the, the God of the world, meaning Satan, but the, our providential God is working out everything for our good. All of it is a plan. He's got his hand in, in everything that's going on. It doesn't mean we should sit back and go to sleep and say, you know, God's got this. Yes, he's got this, but sometimes he uses you and I. Sometimes he has to use a military. Sometimes he has to use a voice and, uh, in order to fulfill his purpose and his plan. That doesn't change in our Christian walk. When God's wanting to lead, uh, the Holy Spirit wants to convict someone, we still need to be that instrument that is sharing and telling and planting that seed. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit can do. The same here. If we're going to survive as a Christian nation, we still have to be that voice, and we need to let the Almighty God do what only He can do and, uh, in bringing this nation back. Brother Mike mentioned it last week that this may be, all of the things that are going on may be a, uh, 
a foretelling or a soon to come another great awakening toward the things of God. I would love to see that in, in my lifetime. One more time, God, before you come back. Um, not because I want to be in a boastful place that says, you know, well, we've been preaching it for years. We told y'all we were right. But to see one more person come to Christ, one more person get snatched out of the pit of hell before you come back. God, use us, use the church, use us to, to you know, do what uh, you, you want to be done. And so I certainly hope that that is the way it is. When I researched this, I found a wonderful uh, video that says it a whole lot better than I can. So for the last few minutes here, it's about 20 minutes long, I want you to listen to this awesome preacher tell, um, proves to us that the America was built on godly principles, on Christian principles. There is a group out there now that says that that is not the founding father's intention, but this guy puts that theory to rest. All right, Mr. Daniel? Listen long enough to the arguments of the American Civil Liberties Union or the Freedom From Religion Foundation or other left-wing groups, and you will come to believe that America was founded by a wide diversity of people from many different faiths. Some deists, some atheists, and yes, a few Christians. But the founders had one goal, and that was to build a completely secular nation that was devoid of any religious, especially Christian influence whatsoever. You'll be told that our founders wanted to erect this unscalable wall around our country that would keep any spiritual influence from seeping into public life. That version of American history belongs in the same category as the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. It is an absolute myth. And though it is completely politically incorrect to say, the truth is this, America was founded as a Christian nation. And our success as a nation depends upon our fidelity to God's word. Now today, we are going to look at the historical evidence by which we can say that America was truly founded as a Christian nation. First of all, let's look at the spiritual beliefs of our founders. Were they neutral toward Christianity? Hardly. 52 of the 55 men who attended the Constitutional Convention were orthodox, conservative Christians. In fact, two of those founders who attended the Constitutional Convention went on to be the head of the American Bible Society, believing that the message of the Bible would transform lives and set the nation on a proper moral course. Yes, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were deists, but even these men understood the importance of a spiritual foundation for our country. Benjamin Franklin believed that the Continental Congress should begin the session seeking the favor of God through prayer. Franklin said, quote, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build, they labor in vain that build it. That was Benjamin Franklin. Consider also the state constitutions. Every state had their own constitution, 
and almost all of the 13 colonies prior to the Constitutional Convention had a state-sponsored religion. And you see this in the qualifications that every state had to go to the Constitutional Convention. For example, if you were from Delaware, listen to one of the things you had to subscribe to. Article 22 of the Delaware Convention said, quote, every person who shall be chosen a member of either house or appointed to any office or place of trust shall make and subscribe to the following declaration. I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures to the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. Today, we don't even require some seminary professors to believe that. Just listen, for example, to George Washington in his first inaugural speech. He said, it would be improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Perhaps the most amazing quote by John Quincy Adams is one that has been disputed by some. So we went back to find the source of this and we found this quote appeared in a publication of Harvard University in 1860. So if I'm wrong, Harvard University is wrong too. But we're not wrong. This is what John Quincy Adams said, quote, the highest, the transcendent glory of the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the precepts of Christianity. If it has never been considered in that light, it is because its compass has not been perceived. Do you hear that? There is an indissoluble bond between the founding of our country and Christianity. That was John Quincy Adams. You say, well, pastor, what about the wall of separation? between the church and the state. I thought that was the founding principle of our nation. Never once do you find the words, the separation of church and state. And yet today, 69% of Americans still believe that that phrase is found somewhere in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution. And we'll see in just a moment where that phrase originated. In fact, the first mention of that phrase, the wall of separation between church and state, doesn't appear in a government document. It appears in a private letter from newly elected President Thomas Jefferson and a group of Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut. In 1801, almost every state, as I said, had a state-sponsored religion. They were Christian religions, but they were different denominations according to the state in which you lived. It so happened in Connecticut that the Congregational Church was the state-sponsored denomination in the state of Connecticut. Well, the Baptists didn't like that very much. And so they would petition the government every year for the tax dollars that had gone to the Congregational Church to be redirected toward their church. On January 1st, 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote this letter in response to their earlier letter. And listen to what he said. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. He's quoting the First Amendment. Thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Now I want you to notice the context. The context had to do with the establishing of one Christian denomination as the state religion, which people were coerced to support financially. And it was in that context that Thomas Jefferson said, no, we are not to establish a state church that coerces people to worship. We're not to elevate one Christian denomination over another. That is clearly the context. Look at the early court rulings in addition to the utterances of our founding fathers. 
I mentioned just several of these cases that show that not only did our judiciary affirm our Christian foundation, but they also encouraged government support of the Christian faith. First of all, the case of Runkel versus Weinmiller in 1799. In that case, the Supreme Court of Maryland said in its decision, quote, by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion. Now stop there and think about that. This is seven years, just seven years, after the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. And now, seven years later, the, United, or the Maryland Supreme Court says, we have an established religion in this country. It is the Christian religion. Were these judges ignorant of the First Amendment? Of course they weren't. They understood the First Amendment better than you do, better than I do, and certainly better than some liberal judge does today. The founders were still alive, the framers of the Constitution. If there was any question, the Maryland Supreme Court could have gone and asked the founders what they mean. No, they said, we have an established religion, but look at the second phrase, and all sects and denominations of Christians are placed upon the same equal footing and are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. What they were saying was, yes, we have an established faith, the Christian faith, but no Christian denomination is to be elevated over another Christian denomination. That again was the intent of the First Amendment. One more I wanna share with you. Vidal versus Gerard's Executors, 1844. This was a very complicated case, but the gist of it is this. A man, very wealthy man in Philadelphia died and in his will, he stipulated that the proceeds of his estate would be used to support a school for orphans. They would call that a college back then, but it was a school for orphans. But he had one stipulation, and that is no Christian clergyman could be allowed to teach in his school. Well, the uh, people of uh, Pennsylvania were upset by that. They were upset that you would have a school in which Christianity couldn't be taught. But the Supreme Court of the United States upheld that man's will using this logic. They said the fact that you don't have a Christian uh, minister teaching doesn't mean the principles of Christianity can't be taught or should be taught. And this is what the Supreme Court said, quote, why may not the Bible and especially the New Testament without note or comment be read and taught as a divine revelation in the college? its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. There is no reason not to teach the Bible in this school and to treat it as the Word of God and to teach its morality to students. Likewise, the court said in the same ruling that we don't have to worry about parody, what effect such a ruling would have on non-Christian rulings. Listen to this, again, amazing. It is unnecessary for us, however, to consider what the legal effect of a device in Pennsylvania for the establishment of a school or college for the propagation of Judaism or deism or any other form of infidelity. Such a case is not to be presumed in a Christian country. Now that is how the early court felt about the Christian faith. Consider also the Christian influence in our country for the first 150 years of our nation. Did you know that for the first 150 years of our country, a school book called the New England Primer was used in schools across our country. The Primer was filled with creeds and with prayers and even with scripture verses that the students had to memorize. In fact, if you were gonna graduate from the third grade, every student had to learn this acrostic from the New England print, uh, Primer. Every letter of the alphabet represented a verse that the students had to memorize. For example, A, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. C, 
Come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. E, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what our students had to memorize in school. Can you imagine what would happen with such a textbook today? We're not even allowed to acknowledge that there might be a creator up there somewhere, that there's some intelligent designer up there who made us. Do you think that has any relationship with the increasing violence we're seeing in our schools? When you teach children that they're nothing but animals, don't be surprised when they act like animals. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what I'm sharing with you is this was the spiritual foundation on which our nation was built. So the natural question is, what happened? What happened? How do you explain this seismic shift in the attitude toward faith in the public square that we've witnessed in these last decades? Well, first of all, the first stone that was laid in the erection of the wall of separation between church and state actually happened in 1947. This was a Supreme Court case, Everson versus the Board of Education. This is the first time the words separation of church and state were ever mentioned in a Supreme Court decision. Isn't this interesting? For the first 150 years of our nation's history, not one Supreme Court decision ever talked about the separation of church and state. The first time it was mentioned was in 1947. You have to ask, if this is such a principle and foundational doctrine of our country, why didn't the Supreme Court refer to it for 150 years? The first time it was mentioned was in the case of Everson and the Board of Education. This case dealt with the state of New Jersey using tax dollars to support religious schools. Now remember back then, most all religious schools were Catholic schools. Remember that. The chief justice of uh, the justice of the Supreme Court who delivered that decision in the Everson case was Justice Hugo Black. And Hugo Black in that decision talked about his desire to build a high and impregnable wall of separation between the church and the state. He wanted to keep the Catholic Church from receiving any support whatsoever. In fact, Justice Clarice Thomas said this, quote, this doctrine of the separation of church and state, he's talking about, this doctrine born in bigotry should be buried. But there you have the first stone in 1947. Then built upon that was the second stone in 1962, Engel versus Vitale. In this case, this court ruled that students in New York City could no longer recite this simple 22-word voluntary prayer. Quote, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Can you imagine saying that's unconstitutional? But the court said, even though it was a to whomever it may concern prayer, not addressed to any particular God, it was still breaching the, quote, constitutional wall of separation between the church and state. The third stone was laid in 1963, Abington School District versus Shemp. Uh, this is a case that said no longer could students voluntarily read 10 verses of the Bible at the beginning of each school day. Uh, the prosecution brought in so-called expert testimony that said that if portions of the New Testament were read without exclamation, they could be psychologically harmful to the students. And therefore, you can't do it. One more, well, two more. The Spain versus DeKalb County in 1967. This is a court case that let stand a lower court ruling in 1966 that said a kindergarten teacher could not any longer allow her students to recite this simple poem. We thank you for the flowers so sweet. We thank you for the food we eat. We thank you for the birds that sing. We thank you for everything. The court said, 
You can't say that anymore in a school. Why? Because even though this poem does not mention God, it might cause the children to think about God, and that is unconstitutional. The culminating ruling, 1980 Stone versus Graham. This is a case involving the display of the Ten Commandments in the halls of Kentucky schools. Listen to what the Supreme Court said, 1980 Stone versus Graham. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments. However desirable this might be as a matter of private devotion, it is not permissible, a permissible state objective under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Again, how do you reconcile that with what the court had said 150 years earlier? Why may not the New Testament be read and taught as divine revelation and its principles of morality inculcated? How do you reconcile that with the words of John Adams who said, our Constitution is made for a moral and religious people. It is totally inadequate to govern any other people. And yet now the Supreme Court says you can't even tell students they're not to lie, steal, and kill. How do you explain this shift? What has happened in the last 60 or 70 years? Has the Constitution changed? And somebody didn't tell us? No. What happened is this. We've allowed the atheist, the secularist, the infidels to pervert our Constitution into something our founders never intended. And we cannot allow that to happen any longer. It is time for us to stand up and say without apology, America was founded as a Christian nation. Consider God's warning to his own people, the nation of Israel, a warning that is just as applicable to us today as it was 3,000 years ago. In Hosea 4, verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget you your children. God is no respecter of people or nations. The nation that reverences God will be blessed by God. The nation that rejects God will be rejected by God. The choice is ours. Good stuff, um, Yep. All right, if you'll turn the lights back up, Daniel, and give us the very first verse, we're going to stand. Anybody got any more comment? Another comment? Let's stand together. In three weeks from now, when we come back, we're going to do Peace in the Valley. You won't want to miss that one either. It's very interesting. All right, let's sing this together. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Brother Ron, will you close our time together, please? Thank you. 